dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan mo na gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ang kalagahan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag po'y siya'y piyagaralan, susulong ang bayan! In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information. Created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SIRP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SIRP widget under the Databases tab or type serp-p.pids.gov.pa. SIRP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2022, SERPI has more than 60 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. On the enhanced website of SERPI, you can filter your research by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. All at the same time! SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner, seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. 
This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication, and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ang kalaghan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! I need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information. Created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SIRP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SIRP widget under the Databases tab or type serp-p.pids.gov.pa. SIRP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2022, SERPI has more than 60 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. On the enhanced website of SERPI, you can filter your research by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. All at the same time! SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources,
EIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Service Through Policy Research. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the PIDS webinar series, where we feature our policy studies and the insights of government policymakers and program implementers, industry experts and practitioners, scholars, and civil society actors. With this webinar series, which we started in 2020, PIDS hopes to provide an accessible venue for evidence-based discussion of current and emerging development issues. I'm Sheila Siar, your moderator. In today's webinar, we will talk about another important topic, this time, the National Expenditure Program, also called the President's Budget. The National Expenditure Program, or NEP, is the totality of the budgets of the various departments of the national government, including support in the local government units and government-owned and controlled corporations. While the lower chamber, or the House of Representatives, has already approved the 2023 budget, it's still being deliberated in the Senate, so our webinar today is very timely. This afternoon, we'll examine how the President's budget for 2023 embodies the identified priority needs of the current administration. To start our conversation and give us more details about today's webinar, may I call on our President at PIDS, Dr. Anaceto Arbeta Jr. Sir? Good afternoon. Uh before we begin, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the following officials. Uh, from the government, we have House of Representatives, Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department, Executive Director Novil Bangsal and Director Elsie Gutierrez, 
Senior Economic uh, Planning Office Executive Director Nervin Salazar. From the academy, we have Southern Luzon State University President Duraci uh, Soleta Nantes, University of Visayas Executive Research Director Victorina Sousa, University of the Philippines College of Law Director for Islamic uh, Law Studies Salma Per Rasul, Central Bicol mm -hmm. Uni State University of Agriculture Planning Director Emerson Bergonio, Polytechnic University of the Philippines Ra uh, Dean Raul Roland Sebastian. From the CSOs, NGOs, and IOs, we have uh, Australian Embassy of the Philippines First Secretary Georgina Hanley Cavano, uh, Embassy of France of the Philippines Economic Attaché Tom Salmon, uh, Asian Development Bank Senior Economist uh, Ekopol uh, Chungval Chungvila Bian Levan, Local Government Development Foundation Deputy Executive Director Antonio Avila, National Movement of Young Legislators, Executive Director of Pritzi Aguado. Let me also greet our guests, colleagues from government, academe, civil society, media, private sector, and those watching through the PIDS and CRP Facebook pages. Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar. Today we will talk about the 2023 President's budget and how it has translated the Marcos administration's priorities into plans and budget. When the current administration started, the country was beset with many challenges, the continuing emerging, the continuing and emerging challenges arising from the COVID-19 pandemic remain a pressing issue for the Philippines. The pandemic severely affected the economy and uh, poverty reduction efforts. Low income and poor Filipinos had to bear uh, the brunt of the rise, rising food, fuel and transportation costs in addition to their average household income decreasing by 2% from 2018 to 2021, based on the annual family income and expenditure survey. Uh, the national government uh, had to borrow more funds to finance the pandemic response. As a consequence, the debt to gross domestic product or GDP ratio is at 63.7%, the highest in 17 years. Uh, inflation continues to threaten uh, businesses and uh, households alike. According to the Philippine Statistics Office or Authority or the PSA, in October 2022, inflation rate is 7.7 percent. This is the highest since December 2008, when the world suffered a financial crisis fueled by the housing bubble. Fortunately, efforts to steer the economy to a higher growth path have proven successful, as the GDP grew by 7.6 percent in the third quarter of 2022. Despite this encouraging development, we must also anticipate the needs of the growing population. PAC estimates that the population has risen from 109 million in 2020 to 112 million in 2022. With a growing population, rising inflation, and government striving to get the economy and its infrastructure projects and services on track, it would be interesting to know how does the 2023 budget anticipate the people's needs and reflect the administration's priorities. Moreover, how will the uh, budget en enable the local government units or NGOs to perform their expanded devolved functions given the Mandana's rolling? This afternoon, we will feature the study analysis of the 2023 president's budget authored by former PIDS research fellow, uh, Dr. Charlotte Justin Jokno Sikat, senior research specialist, Robert Hector Polimar, and research analyst, Mas Cruz. General Ruiz. Dr. Jukla Sikat and Mr. Ruiz will present their analysis of the National Expenditure Program or NAP, uh, including allocations for LGUs and the Growth Equity Fund. They will also provide their findings uh, on the sustainability, tax buoyancy, and risks that require uh, mitigation. To enrich our discussion, we invited experts who will uh, share their insights on the national budget. First, we have the Department of Budget Management Assistant Secretary Orlando Toledo, who will share updates on the allocations of the LGUs and how the budget addresses the challenges such as unequal de de development, high poverty incidents, and disparities in the capacity of our LGUs. We also have Philipp uh, Mr. Filomeno Santa Ana, uh, co-founder of the Action for Economic 
reforms or AER and uh, UP School of Economics Alumni Association Distinguished Alumnus Awardee. Mr. Santa Ana will share his insights on the fiscal consolidation and what must be done for the country and the economy to thrive amidst these challenging times. It is an honor for PIDS to have you both at this event and hear your insights on the topic. To our attendees, please stay until the end of the seminar and I encourage you to participate actively in the open forum. Thank you, and I'll give back the floor to the moderator, Sheila. Thank you very much, Dr. Odetta. Friends, uh, before I introduce our presenters, allow me to remind you of our guidelines to join the discussion. So you may post your questions and comments using the Q&A button. I repeat, please use the Q&A button at the chat box. Please indicate your name and organization if you want to be identified when I read out the questions. So, and uh, to all uh, the presenters, to all presenters and discussants, you may respond by typing your answers, which will be visible to all attendees. Alternatively, you can choose to answer the comments live during the open forum. For our um, live stream viewers on Facebook, we highly encourage you to participate as well. Please use the comment section on Facebook for your questions. We'll accommodate as many questions as possible that are relevant to the discussion during the open forum. So now that we have set the house rules, let us begin our conversation by listening to the presentation from, as, as mentioned by Dr. Abeta, the PIDS discussion paper titled Analysis of the 2023 President's Budget, authored by former uh, PIDS Research Fellow uh, Justin Sikat, Senior Research Specialist uh, Robert Palomar, and Research Analyst Mark Gerald Ruiz. The presentation will be made by Dr. Sikat and Mr. Um, Mr. Ruiz. Okay? So Dr. Uh, Sikat's um, academic and professional experience is focused on public sector economics and political economy. As a former professor at UP Diliman, she taught courses on public sector and development economics and fiscal and monetary policy. She is also an international consultant in the areas of public expenditure and financial management at the uh, national and local government levels. She has a PhD in business administration, a PhD in economics candidacy, and um, master's in management and economics, all from the U University of the Philippines, Diliman. Meanwhile, Mr. Mark Ruiz has uh, an economics degree from the La Salle University. His areas, his research areas include public sector finance and human capital development. Dr. Uh, Sika and uh, Mark. And thank you also to President Urbeta for the kind introduction. At this point, I'd like to thank also the discussants who took, took the time out to join us here. I'd like to also thank my co-authors, uh, Mr. Robert Palomar, um, Mr. Mark Ruiz, as well as those who helped out in this in the data and in the study, um, Ms. Rixi Madawin and Ms. Lucy Melendez. And the, to the discussants, thank you to Yusuf uh, Rolly Toledo and Mr. Filomena Santa Ana. So I'll be discussing with you uh, the analysis of the president's budget. I'd like to say at the onset that this was drafted while I was still a research fellow with the PIDS earlier this year. Now, there are major shifts in governance in 2022 uh, in the Philippines. This would be impacting our uh, 2023 budget. So there's a new president and administration that was elected and installed this year. There is increased devolution with the Mandanas ruling. I'll explain this more later on, implementation. Still managing and recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic. So as we can see in the chart here, there was a drastic drop in GDP of this was about 9.6%. Uh, and then it... Um, recovered to about 5.6% in 2021. Now, this is first and foremost in the minds of the policymakers, which is why we try to examine the president's budget in this particular line. Now, what was the basis of the drafting of the president's budget for 2023? Well, since it was drafted starting this year, so the budget call was drafted by the previous administration, and that followed the 0 to 10-point agenda. Um, what was new and installed um, in the middle of the process of drafting the budget was this medium-term fiscal framework, which um, would provide guidance moving forward uh, uh, in the medium term. And uh, the new administration also, during the drafting of this particular budget, identified its eight-point socioeconomic agenda, which uh, has similarities with the earlier ones, but I'll discuss that more later on. 
Now, the national budget call for 2023 during the Duterte's administration or the previous administration was based on the zero 10 point agenda. The Philippine Development Plan at the time, from 2017 up until 2022, the Public Investment Program, as well as the three year rolling infrastructure program. Now, also in mind um, was the implementation of the Mandanas Garcia Supreme Court ruling. So, for the benefit of those who are not familiar with this, what the Mandanas Garcia Supreme Court ruling did was it broadened the base on which to estimate the intergovernmental fiscal transfers that are given to local governments every year. And because of broadening the base, that means that um, the impact would reducing the fiscal space from the national government perspective. And, uh, you know, this on top of the priorities of continued recovery of the economy um, made the policymakers decide to redevolve certain functions that were already devolved by the 1991 Local Government Code of the Philippines. And this is where the Philippines is at right now, this current transition of the assumption of additional devolved functions. Well, not additional devolved functions. These were the fun functions that were already devolved 30 years ago, but for which LGUs received uh, assistance. Now, in the national budget call, there were explicit um, sections or uh, uh, guidelines as to how to address the Mandanas ruling. So relative to the process of devolution, due to the Mandanas ruling, national government agencies should A, refrain from including proposals funding devolved local projects for the first to fifth, fourth income class LGUs. So for the benefit of those who are not familiar, the Philippines, we have a decentralized form of government and we classify the different levels of local governments according to their income, first to sixth, the first being the richest and the sixth being the poorest. So the, the, the idea that the focus for any assistance to LGUs during this transition would be towards the poorer and more disadvantaged LGUs. Now, uh, funding requirement for capacity building also should be refrained, except these would be directed towards the poor LGUs and to limit subsidies for local projects to LGUs, um, particularly the need for focus on the poorer ones or the geographically isolated and depressed areas and those with highest poverty incidences and ranked in the top third highest. The way this was operationalized, I'll discuss briefly, but I think uh, Secretary Toledo has a uh, 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 more extensive uh, discussion of this later on. Now, what is an innovation in the budgeting system for this particular fiscal year was the introduction of a medium-term fiscal framework, or MTFF, for 2022 to 2028. The objective is to consolidate resources of the national government to be better maximized and utilized, and the intent is to lead the achievement of short-term economic goals and steer the economy to a high growth path that is sustainable and inclusive by 2028. Now, budget preparations from 2023 un until the end of the administrations must be aligned with the MTFF, including the president's budget. So this was an executive branch initiated, but of course it was aligned with the legislative branch and uh, there was a sign off to the US Senate resolution that agreed to this. Now, what are the targets of the, of the 2022 to 2028 MTFF to attain six to 7.5% growth uh, in 2022? Uh, 6.5 to 8 percent real GDP growth annually between 2023 to 2028, 9 percent single digit poverty rate by 2028, and 3 percent national government deficit to GDP ratio by 2028, and less than 60 percent that uh, public debt ratio by 2025, as well as an increase in the attainment of upper middle income tax status. So these are the targets of the MTFF. Now this is just to show you a comparison of the Social economic agenda of the two administrations, um, the 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 immediately um, the one that um, just left office, which would be the Duterte administration, and the succeeding one, which would be the Marcos uh, administration. Now we see here, if you compare, there are similarities. There still is the push for infrastructure. There still is focus on human capital development as well as social protection services. There are a couple of differences, though. Tax reform during the Duterte administration was priority, but since some of the reforms were already instituted through the CREATE law and the CHAIN law, um, the, this current administration will be just picking up the remaining reform packages on real property valuation as well as the PIFITA um, and mining uh, laws that are still pending in Congress. Now, job creation and is another uh, 
clear identified priority of this administration. Though this was also the bureaucratic efficiency and right sizing was also included in the 10 point uh, socioeconomic agenda, but it was overtaken by other priorities. Now still, top five priorities indicated in the president's budget message would be education, public works, health, social welfare, and agriculture. Now the objectives and policy question of this is really, how does the 2023 5.268 trillion uh, proposed budget prioritize the different sector, continue the transition to strengthen devolution and local governance, and uh, further the need for con fiscal consolidation? Specific objectives really is to look at the distribution versus the national budget called identified priority areas, uh, as well as the other frameworks used to draft the budget and examine the allocations for local governments as devolution due to the uh, Mandanas ruling. Now, just a brief uh, word on the framework. Uh, the study will analyze the so relative to budget priorities. Now, it's important to consider that the national budget is a common resource with many public sector instrumentalities and national government agencies vying for a larger share of it. But being a limited resource, increased shares of one agency or sector in the national budget can reduce the share of other agencies and sectors because of the negative externality imposed by the one getting a larger share. So bottom line, what we're saying here is the nominal values and the real values. Yes, these indeed are very important, especially if you're going to be comparing expenditures across different countries uh, by sector. But our focus here is really to see the prioritization, which is why we look at the trends in the relative shares of the different sectors to the budget and its trend through time. We have our time series from 1980s, from the still starting from the 1980s. Now, this research will use a mixed methods approach with descriptive research design. It will use secondary data, mostly from government sources, and it will look at budget statistics from 83 onwards. Now, just a brief uh, discussion to refresh your macroeconomic memory. So here we have the aggregate demand or the national income accounting identity function, which tries to explain what impacts GDP or the production of goods and services in an economy. And there are four main variables here. Consumption spending, which is done by households and individuals. Investment spending, which is done by businesses. Government spending, which is basically the national budget and, uh, and other public sector in instrumentality spending as well as net exports. So for consumption spending, goods and services are bought by the households such as non-durable goods, durable goods and services. Now for investment, uh, sorry, going back. For consumption spending, this is a function of taxes, okay? So the assumption is that if your income net of taxes increases, your consumption will also increase. And this will trigger demand for goods and services in the economy, which will trigger production, which will therefore increase GDP. So that's the, the, the process through which consumption spending and fiscal policy through taxes would impact uh, GDP. Now for investment, goods and services bought for future use, such as business fixed investments, residential investments, new house and inventory. This is a function of real interest rates. So as real interest rates increase, it becomes more costly to borrow. Therefore, it discourages investment. But the converse is true as interest rates decrease. It encourages more investment behavior. Therefore, it will trigger more demand of these goods and services in the economy, increasing GDP. Now, in terms of government spending, which is mostly the national budget, this is the government purchases of goods and services, but by national and local government. So the government here operates like a, uh, like a consumer in the economy. And this is where uh, the thought of, you know, jump-starting or pump priming the economy comes from, from government spending. And there has been empirical evidence uh, published in 2021 by De Buque Gonzalez, a fellow PIDS uh, research fellow. And she found that uh, at the, for regional expenditures, spending on infrastructure really leads to the largest multiplier effect on GDP. So what's the multiplier effect? When you trigger something this, let's say you increase government spending, this creates income for households and businesses. If you're building a road, it would create income for a business and they would hire workers that would create incomes from them for them, and they would buy supplies in the market that would create income for the suppliers. And that is what would trigger economic activity, therefore increasing GDP. Now, um, the final would be net exports, which is a function of the real exchange rate. So net exports is exports less imports. So as your real exchange rate depreciates, okay, so here in the Philippines, we have a flexible exchange rate regime, and we say depreciate, not devaluate. Okay, so if your exchange rate depreciates, therefore your goods produced in the Philippines becomes relatively cheaper from the point of view of foreigners. 
and therefore becomes more attractive and it should trigger uh, improved exports. A uh, chatted is paribus, okay, so this is just, you know, in a, nutsh in a, in a vacuum. But if your exchange rate appreciates, this makes your goods relatively more expensive from the point of view of foreigners, therefore decreases the demand. At the same time, it would make imports cheaper from the Filipino consumer's perspective, therefore making uh, increasing imports. So that's how aggregate demand works. And this is how the different fiscal policy variables would impact GDP by theory. Now, the proposed 2023 budget is 5.268 trillion pesos. Here we see the trend line from 2000 to 2023 of nominal and real uh, national government expenditures. This is in million pesos. Now we had to cut the, the trend because there was a change in the basis uh, or the, yeah, the real value 100 became in 2018. So that's when we controlled for prices. So as you can see, since 2018 is equal to one, of course, the real value of expenditures is greater than what the nominal value is. But moving forward, we would expect that as you know, prices increase, there would be a widening gap between the nominal and the real um, real value for, for expenditures. Now, let's take a look at the proposed budget and its distribution by expense class. So we have current operating expenditures, we have capital outlays, and then we have a net spending. So in the 2023 budget, the largest portion proportion went to current operating expenditures. And for the past 40 years, this has always been the trend. The current operating expenditures, she receives the largest share, averaging about 78.8%. So current operating expenditures would increase, include the cost of, you know, the bureaucracy, personal services, and maintenance and other, other operating expenditures. Now, as we can see here, from since 2015, so this middle line here would be your capital outlay spending. As a share of the uh, budget, it has been receiving a, a larger share. And then it's 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 found its way down, but but the pronouncements of the current administration is that they will be increasing, uh, continuing investments in hard infrastructure. Now this would uh, show you this as a share of GDP. Okay, so capital outlays as a, as a share of GDP was higher than four percent for the first time in the last four decades in 2015. So you see here there was a uh, a big spike after 2014. This peaked at 27 in, in 2017 at 6.5 percent, uh, 6.7 of GDP, and is proposed to have 5.2 percent with 5 percent for infrastructure in 2023. Now, when we talk about the distribution of the national government expenditures by sector, we see that social services is poised to get a 7.2 percent increase from 2022, and still has maintained the largest share of the budget at 39.3 percent. Okay, so this shows you the figures, uh, the share, the distribution for in the proposed 2023 budget. Now, economic services has uh, an increase of 2.3%, but received less share from 29, a smaller share from 29.7 to 29%. Now, this is consistent with the trend for social services since 1995, as you can see here. So social services is going up in the proposed budget in 2023 um, with some reductions in, uh, with a reduced share of, uh, general public services here. Now, if we look at the subsectors, so we're just looking at social services here, and we're looking at the distribution. Under social services, we would have education, culture, and manpower development, health spending, social security, welfare, and employment spending, housing and community development spending, as well as land distribution, other social services, and the subsidy to LGUs. Those still being the largest, the share of education, culture, and manpower has decreased in 2020 to 38.7%. And this is when we, we all know that COVID-19 hit. Now, to make this was to make room for social security, welfare, and employment and health benefits. So during that time, it was social security in the form of AYUDA and other transfers um, to address, to manage the COVID-19 pandemic. These are when these increased. Now, social security, uh, labor and welfare and health are supposed to increase slightly in 2023, as you can see here. And the subsidy to LGUs will decrease the most from 19.7% to 15.9%. And we'll see this is because of the formalized nature of the transfers to local governments, which I'll be describing later on. Now, in terms of economic sub uh, subsectors, so we're just looking at economic services here, communications, roads, 
and other transportation is allotted more than half of the shares for economic services at 53.6%. So it takes up a huge uh, pie of the economic services uh, up from 52.6%. Now, agriculture, agrarian reform, and natural resources is proposed to have a 14.8% increase from 11.5%. Uh, and the increase in uh, communication loads and other transportation and agri was possibly due to the reduced share of subsidies to LGUs. Again, uh, this is because of the formal-like nature of these transfers. Now, this is just the top 10 budgets. Um, I'll just, you know, uh, go through this briefly, the top three, I guess. So for TBWH, the, the budget uh, decreased by 8.7%. For DepEd, it increased by 12.6%. For DILG, it's basically the same. Say basically the same. So Let's go on to the top five special purpose funds in the budget. So the top five special purpose funds in the 2023 NEP is the same as the top five of the 2022 GAAs. Now, the unprogrammed appropriations is the highest proposed in terms of the special purpose funds, followed by the pension and gratuity fund here, the PGF here. Now, the, the unprogrammed appropriation is worth 46.8% of all uh, SPFs or 13.8% 13, 13 of the 2023 NEP. Miscellaneous personnel benefits saw the highest growth with a 220% increase in 2023. Now, let's take a look at the health insurance and social protection program. So, as I said earlier, we're still managing, the policymakers are still managing, and we're hoping we're emerging already from this pandemic. But we will see here that there, were, uh, there was a large infusion of budgetary support for thin health uh, in, since the COVID-19 pandemic. So, there's a budgetary support spikes in 2023 for contributions of indigents, senior citizens, PWDs, and financially incapable point-of-service persons. Also for the PAMANA beneficiaries and the benefit package improvement under the universal health care law. So this, this there was also in, um, a continued increase since the pandemic. Now for social welfare programs, we can see here uh, from 2014 to 2023, the 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 really bu the bulk of the budget of the Department of Social Welfare goes to the four piece program, which is the conditional cash transfer program of the Philippines, given conditionally on certain conditions for education and health. So here we saw that there was a a, 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 a spike, continued increase. Now since 2020, also there has been increased allocations for the protective services under the DSWP. Okay. Now let's just uh, skip over this to the implementation of the Mandanas Garcia Supreme Court ruling. So this is also something that we are monitoring and we will continue to monitor through its implementation. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there was a broadening of the base of the computation of the intergovernmental fiscal transfers of local governments, which before was known as the internal revenue allotment, but now is known as the national tax allotment. And uh, the national tax allotment is computed based on the third year prior. So, for example, the national tax allotment for 2023 to be given to LGUs was computed based on national government revenues collected in 2020. And we know that's when COVID-19 pandemic hit, and that's when revenues collapsed um, for the Philippines because of the, 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 the contraction in the economy because of the economic lockdowns to manage the control, uh, to manage the spread of the COVID-19 virus. So that's why there's an anticipated 14.5% decrease um, in the national tax allotments for 2023. Now, despite the decrease, the total proposed allotment for the NATA is still 820.3 billion and is still the highest outside of 2022. In 2022, it is about 959 billion, which translated into about 19% of the 5.024 trillion budget of 2022. Now here, what are the changes in LGU programs due to the Mandana ruling? So as I mentioned earlier, one of the solutions of policymakers um, to, you know, to, 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 to address the reduction in fiscal space, but still to be able to allow to, uh, for continued spending uh, for more uh, broader national government objectives, uh, one was to redevolve the functions or reduce the um, assistance to local governments through national government programs. These are programs that say primarily for infrastructure, which local governments had received assistance from, even if this were these functions were devolved back in uh, 1992. So there was reduced allocations for national government LGU assistance programs with a decreased NATA, 
And part of this would be under the DPWH or the Department of Public Works and Highways Basic Infrastructure Program, which decreased from uh, 85.4% 4 billion in 2022 to 52.5 billion in the 2023 net, mainly because of the decrease in the budget for flood control and national roads and bridges. And this, this primarily were um, because of the national budget calls indication that assistance programs should be targeted more towards the, the poor and to, to refrain from proposing uh, allocations for the richer LGUs, the first to fourth income class. Now, the last, what the national government uh, also did, policymakers, they also introduced what they call the fiscal equalization fund this year, which is the growth equity fund, which we will, it's still being implemented this year, but we will hear a little bit more about this later on from Secretary Nicoletto. Now, for the growth equity fund, all that needs to be, uh, I'll just skim through this. No? The purpose of the growth equity fund is to address issues on marginalization, unequal development, and to cover the funding requirement of programs, projects, and activities of poor, disadvantaged, and lagging LGUs to gradually enable the full and efficient implementation of the functions and services devolved to them. So the eligibility is only for provinces, uh, cities in the fourth income bracket and municipalities in the fourth and fifth income brackets and barangays in Chida areas. So these are the ge geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas in the fourth and fifth income brackets. So this is still currently being implemented and being dispersed until the end of this year. The proposal originally in last year's budget was 10 billion, but what came out of the budget of 20, in 2022 was 1.25 billion. So the proposal in the 2023 NEP budget, at, yeah, President's budget is 13.9 billion. Um, and we'll see how it fares when it comes out of the, the, the Congress this year. Now, this is just quickly uh, in, in aligned with the bureaucratic efficiency efforts of the current administration. Only uh, there's there's about 12.47 billion allocation for ICT projects throughout the bureaucracy, but this is equivalent only to about 0.24 percent of the total budget. Now on fiscal balance and government financing. For, so for this, the first part when we discuss the debt, it comes from a paper that was published earlier this year by the Buki Gonzalez myself on debt sustainability. So we conducted a debt sustainability analysis. But um, before we go to that, no, the fiscal balance. So the fiscal, Philippines has had fiscal deficits for the past 40 years, aside from 95 and 97 before the Asian financial crisis. So the green line on top would be expenditures. The yellow line would be revenues. The black line would be the primary balance. So the primary balance is what is considered to be the more productive spending of government. So it's revenues less, less national government spending net of debt servicing. So you remove interest payments there and you really look at the productive um, part of government spending there. And the national government account balance is what is typically referred to as the fiscal balance or the fiscal deficit. So you see it's lower there because it includes also the debt servicing. As you can see, revenues collapsed here in, um, in, in 2020 um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, because of the lockdowns, uh, reduced economic activity. So this is what triggered uh, a, a, a spike in our uh, fiscal deficit. Okay. Now, what this the, the slide is just saying that according to the Department of Budget and Management, uh, there will still be continued need for borrowing. Um, but uh, up until 2023, they targeted uh, the net financing requirement deficit to be about 8.8% uh, of GDP or 2.082 trillion. Now, if you take a look at the trend line for outstanding debt, okay, so debt to GDP in 2023 is expected to reach about 61.5% which is a slight decline from the uh, 2022 projected in uh, for this particular year. So that's what you can see here. But what's important to note also is that most of the debt is primarily domestic, okay? It, uh, a, a smaller proportion is a foreign debt. So this has, this is a bit of a, you know, safety net for those concerned with the fluctuating exchange rate. Um, we're a bit protected here because the policy of the government ever since the 2000s is really to, to borrow more domestically than uh, from foreign sources. Now, as I mentioned earlier, earlier this year, we conducted a debt sustainability analysis and we, re we issued, the, we released a discussion paper. It's available on the website, along with uh, Dr. Maggie Debuca Gonzalez. And the first part of that report actually used the publicly available IMF DSA template, which projects public debt. Uh, we used government data and 
bottom line, I, I know I have limited time. What we're just trying to look at is the trajectory of medium-term debt, public debt ratio, and we're looking at the effect of real interest rates, real GDP growth, real exchange rate, and the primary balance. So the effect of the real exchange rate real exchange rate fluctuations and the effective real interest rates would be positive, meaning if these, uh, if the real exchange interest rates increase, uh, this would trigger uh, possibly higher debt to GDP ratio in this formula. In the case of the real exchange rate, as the real exchange rate depreciates, this would also um, trigger an increase in debt to GDP ratio. In the case of um, the contribution of real GDP growth, this has a negative impact because as your real as your economy grows, revenues increase. Therefore, there's less need to borrow. Same thing with the primary balance, of course, because it's impacted by your GDP growth through the primary balance. As it improves, uh, if your revenues are greater than your spending, or as your revenues approach your spending, this would reduce the need to borrow. Now, here's just you know this was drafted back in March. Uh, released in June, so so these figures could be you know more updated. But we here we projected that uh, the uh, uh, debt to GDP ratio would peak in 2023. Uh, in the, so we did different scenarios. One including so we found extra budgetary changes in cash. We found extra cash in the rec in the in the accounts, government accounts. So if we incorporated it as debt. Uh, there would be higher debt to GDP ratio that would be projected, but if we included it as you know what could be used to pay off debt uh, since it's a uh, change in cash, then it would be lower by about 2.6 percentage points. But it would still peak in 2023 or 2024. And this was based again on our data back in 20 uh, earlier this year. Now, what were the identified risks to that? And this is something I think that should be uh, you know um, given attention. So. Well, the finding was that that will gradually decline, provided that there are no policy reversals, okay, no changes in the current tax regime, um, or any reversal in policies that would have huge impacts on revenues. Now, that would compromise the previous improvement of Philippine debt should be introduced. Now, when we did some stress testing of the macro fiscal of the different stress tests we conducted, it's the real GDP growth shocks like the COVID nineteen pandemic, etc that would impact the economy and um, you know, cause pressure on that sustainability. Mandana's ruling also is, is identified as a risk to that. Um, net losses of the PhilHealth also, and military and uniform personal pensions. So for this one, uh, the issue here is that um, the national government is paying for the pensions through the national budget. And um, there, there is actually current, uh, I, I know that there is a legislative action or measures already in Congress being proposed, even from the previous administration. So this just shows the results of, you know, no, not really the results. It just shows you the amount that has been allocated through the national budget for the um, military uniformed um, personnel. Um, but I think that should be for, you know, that should be another paper in itself, uh, just to just to bring up that. As, as also a potential risk. Now I'll hand this hand you over to to Mark Ruiz, who will discuss tax buoyancy. Tax buoyancy here actually is similar to uh, a paper that was a background paper for the Asian Development Outlook that was drafted earlier this year, and I know that um, Ecopol is present. So this is this is what I mentioned to you before. So uh, Mark, please. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Justine. Uh, this is just a short exercise that we included in the paper. Uh, Dr. Sikat has already discussed the, the various risks that we have uh, looming in the country. And because of the widened deficit, uh, the government has emphasized the need to come through with its uh, fiscal consolidation and the resource mobilization plan. The strategy is to have more economic activity, uh, which would lead to a more sustainable debt and more tax revenues. But this depends on the flexibility of the tax system. So what we thought of is the concept of tax buoyancy, which measures the impact of changes in national income to the changes in tax revenue. Uh, based on literature, uh, we are able to differentiate long run and short run buoyancy as well. The former can be interpreted as an indication of fiscal stability, while the short run gauges the performance of the fiscal policies to act as automatic stabilizers in the economy. In the results that we will show later, uh, a coefficient equal to one means that taxes are stable 
pricing together with GDP. Uh, coefficient greater than one means tax revenue is uh, moving faster than GDP, which could help the government in uh, reducing the fiscal deficit. However, when looking at the perspective of the long term, uh, in theory, this should not be the case that uh, long run tax buoyancy is greater than one, as this would mean that taxes are rising indefinitely. And uh, we, we assume that this would converge to one. A coefficient less than one means that revenues relative to, G to GDP are falling, which is a risk and the government would have to address this with the policies for a more uh, pro progressive tax system. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I will now, I will not bore you with the uh, mathematics, but uh, basically we employed two methodologies. One uh, is running the, regress the regression through a single equation, and another is running the long run and the short run uh, equation separately. Uh, another variable of interest here is, uh, is fee or the speed of uh, adjustment, which measures how much of the discrepancy between the long run and the short run is corrected within uh, one time period, in this case, uh, one year. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here are our results. Uh, both methods produced um, a higher coefficient in the short run than in the long run. Also, the fully, mo fully modified OLS generated uh, slightly higher uh, numbers than, of, than that of the ARDL error correction model. Uh, based on these results, uh, they seem to suggest that uh, taxes are buoyant in the short run, which is which is good, since that implies that taxes are reactive to the changes in GDP, but maybe not as much in in the long run. Uh, but overall, uh, we see that this this is in line with the the recent fis, uh, fiscal state statement of the DBCC, wherein they said that uh, tax revenue collection is uh, buoyant. However, we need we emphasize that uh, this the our results does not guarantee fiscal stability, since uh, as identified earlier, there are looming risks that uh, we have to address and uh, monitor. Uh, lastly, for the speed of adjustment, uh, we generated twenty three point six and uh, twenty five percent. So this means that this. Is this is how much is uh, corrected with, uh, in the deviation the, from the deviation of the short run to the long run. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a comparison of uh, the results that we got against the computation of uh, from of DBCC in the in the, in the fiscal risk uh, fiscal statistics handbook, which is uh, uh, revenue growth divided by uh, GDP growth. Essentially, what we are seeing here is that uh, the tax system seems to be more stable in the past decade relative to the uh, decades prior. Um, so from this exercise, uh, we go back to the definition of tax buoyancy, which, uh, which could give us an idea of the role of revenue policy in ensuring fiscal sustainability. And it's all, it also helps us examine the, if the government is keeping tax mobilization in line with economic activity. Uh, what we are seeing is that uh, taxes are buoyant, but there may need to be further improvement if we expect, we expect revenues to rise and if we are aiming for a more stable revenue generation in line with the medium term framework. Uh, and uh, to end the presentation and for the general findings, I hand the reins back to Dr. Sikat. Okay, thank you, Mark. So just some, you know, uh, general findings uh, with respect to expenditure trends. So generally the same, but with slight shifts in priorities, there were increases in the shares of subsectors of social services, such as education, manpower development, and those. In economic services, the same also, we found the, some subsectors shares increased 
But generally, what was what could be found is that the subsidy to LGUs decreased, and primarily because of the reason I mentioned earlier. The, the collections, national government collections collapsed in 2020. So therefore the transfers also had collapsed in the 2020, uh, in, in the fiscal year of 2020. Therefore this year, uh, LGUs will be receiving uh, lower NATA, what we call lower transfers. Now there has also been reduced NG LGU support programs, the, D, the DPWH program I mentioned earlier on uh, basic infrastructure. But this, uh, according to the uh, policymakers, have been uh, authorities have been mitigated by increased support fund through the special purpose funds, such as the, and also the the growth equity fund. Now, for financing expenditures in the budget, the debt to GDP ratio is, pro is projected to peak at sixty six point two percent in twenty twenty four. Okay, so this is again um, uh, could be updated the figure, so it might be slightly different now, and will gradually decline in the succeeding years. So that is sustainable. And the updated figures of the fan chart, as well as the generated debt stabilizing primary balance of 2.2% shows that that is still manageable. However, there are risks that must be addressed, particularly any real GDP growth shocks and primary balance shocks, um, which I enumerated earlier, the Mandana shooting, uh, net losses of ill health and the military uniform pensions. However, there's also, uh, no, I already said that. Now, Finally, uh, regression estimates on tax buoyancy are similar for both methods, with short-run tax buoyancies being more buoyant and long-run being less buoyant. These are consistent with some studies, earlier findings, like that of the uh, uh, Hill, Ginger Rock, and the NTRC, and Janus. Um, but still, so relatively, the, there are buoyant taxes, but we might still be able to improve. Particularly, I'm a strong advocate of the property valuation. Uh, efforts that are currently in uh, Congress right now. So that ends our presentation. Thank you for your patience. Sorry if we went over a bit. Thanks, Sheila. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Sikat and Mr. Ruiz for that uh, comprehensive presentation. So you may have questions for them and we will entertain your questions during uh, the open forum. So there are several aspects of the budget and the author's analysis that are worthy for the discussion. So to enrich our um, conversation and see and uh, look at another perspective, let us listen to the comments of our discussants. First, uh, we are honored to have with us uh, Mr. Rolando Toledo, the Assistant uh, Secretary of the Local Government and Regional Operations Group of the Department of Budget and Management, or DPM. Asset uh, Rolly assists in the supervision of the Local Government and Regional Coordination Bureau and uh, the Department's regional offices in ensuring the budget and management policies are consistently implemented in the, D in the DBM regional offices, specifically on the administration of the National Tax Allotment, Public Expenditure Management Reforms, and regional offices activities and concerns, among others. He also supervises the operations of the Philippine Open Government Partnership and the participatory governance cluster of the cabinet and its secretariats in promoting fiscal transparency and participatory governance of the administration. He is a certified public accountant and has a bachelor's degree in business administration. Uh, given his assignment in the DBM, we have asked him to provide uh, his uh, not only his comments on the office analysis, but also, uh, that pertaining to uh, the LGUs, uh, particularly uh, updates on uh, the allocation for the LGUs due to the Mandanis Garcia ruling, including the Growth Equity Fund. Asek Toledo, you now have the virtual floor. All right. So thank you very much, Sheila. So uh, good afternoon to everyone. Okay. Uh, thank you for inviting the DBN to be a part of this uh, public webinar on share the latest development on the Mandanas Garcia case. But yes, uh, as mentioned by Sheila, based on the invitation uh, for me being uh, to be a discussant, I was asked to comment on this study and specifically to share insights or updates on the allocation of the local governments due to the Mandanas ruling, including the GEF. But before I go into this, uh, the Mandana uh, Supreme Court ruling or in the, even the implementation of the GF, let me just say that, first of all, we fully agree 
and concur of the findings of the study and the way forward. Uh, but yes, uh, with some, of course, um, minor or minor comments or clarifications has to be made. Okay, first, uh, first on the screen, uh, you can see that the, uh, of course, the, the budget or the fiscal year 2023 proposed budget is a tailor fit according to the eight-point socioeconomic agenda, which outlines the strategies to address the immediate issues of inflation, socioeconomic scary, and low income. So to arrest inflation, uh, constraint on food, energy, and transportation, and logistics sectors will be holistically uh, addressed, of course, to ensure that there is enough supply of basic goods and services that is affordable and accessible to all. Now, to reduce the vulnerability and scaring off uh, for, from COVID-19, the government will continue to implement the risk and manage intervention, uh, to implement risk management intervention, to fully reopen the economy, and of course, to ensure the, an embedded uh, and adequate delivery of social services, such as health, education, and social protection which is consistent of what has been presented by Dr. Jo Sika, uh, Dr. S uh, Justine, uh, in terms of the dimension that she, uh, she presented based on this study. So it's really, uh, uh, this is a tailored feed according to this economic project, at the same time, the budget. So there will be a complement, this will be complemented, of course, with the production, uh, promotion of productivity, enhancing investment, while exercising prudence in fiscal management. Again, this is uh, as far as the medium-term fiscal balance or medium-term fiscal framework and the fiscal balance. Again, this is consistent of the government's fiscal consolidation strategy that was presented also by Dr. Jokno. I see that, okay. Which supports the administration's socioeconomic development agenda, but of course, mindful of the risk of high debt levels on growth and sustainability. The, uh, will be, this will be underpinned by increasing revenue efforts as also shown uh, through tax policy and tax administration reforms, as well as declining the deficit target or the trajectory over the medium term. As also revenues are projected to reach a 17.6% of GDP in 2028 from this year's 15.2% of GDP Meanwhile, the deficit is expected to reach the pre-pandemic level beginning 2027, that is uh, at 3.2% of GDP before closing at 3% of GDP by 2028. So this is in contrast to the 8.6% of GDP actual deficit of 20, in 2021 and the 7.6% of GDP growth program for this year. But despite the declining deficit path, government disbursement will remain above 20%. That is a, a percent of GDP. So that's, uh, as you can see in the formula of the uh, national income, that is the 20% of GDP. That is the equivalent share as far as the government spending is concerned. So on the average, uh, that is on the average over over the entire plan period with infrastructure spending, I want to emphasize projected to reach around 5% or between 5% to 6% of GDP for the next six years. So again, uh, alongside the uh, uh, faster economic growth, the national government debt to GDP uh, ratio is seen to decrease from this year's estimate of 62% of GDP and reach less than 60% by 2025 and is projected to further decline to 51.2% uh, by 2028. So uh, in general, yes, uh, we fully uh, concur with the study as findings as far as expenditure and even the uh, dimension of the budget. Now may I move now on the specific uh, uh, request or rather, uh, as far as based on the requests. Uh, so I will just focus now on the uh, uh, the NTA and the ruling of the Mandanas case, okay? So yeah, section six of the, section six, article 10 of the 1987 constitution 
provides that local governments shall have a just share, as determined by law, in the national taxes which shall be automatically released to them. So Section 284, the Local Government Code of 1987, Republic Act RA 7160, provides that local government units shall have 40% share in the national internal revenue or based on the collections of the third fiscal proceeding year. Okay, so now in 2018, the Supreme Court ruling, okay, of the Mandanas Garcia petition directed the national government to change the basis of the computation of the just share of LGUs to all national tax, including the collections of custom duties by the Bureau of Customs. So on this slide presented graphically, uh, is the expansion of the base of the computation of ERA, or now called the National Tax Allotment or NTA shares before and after the Madanas ruling. Okay, so if you can see the left chart shows that the basis of the computation of the NTA before the Supreme Court ruling, the bigger pie is the national taxes and a subset of it, uh, of it is the NIRT, the National Internal Revenue Taxes. Okay, 40% of the NIRT goes to the local government units as ERA and 60% is left to the national government. Now, the ERA, you know, as mentioned, is now called the National Tax Allotment. So after the Mandana's ruling is uh, the man implemented as shown on the right side, a right pie chart, we can see that the basis of computation of NTAs expanded from NIRT to all national taxes, which effectively means expansion of resources transferred to local government units. Okay, so this table shows the actual fiscal impact of the Supreme ruling on the Madanas Garcia case but, and fiscal year 2022. Essentially, uh, the local government units receive an increase of 185.17 billion in the fiscal year 2022 NTA. So as a result, the inclusion of all national taxes in the determination of the just shares of LG. So, yeah, without the uh, Supreme Court ruling, the NTA of LG will only be around 773.87 billion. But with the implementation of the Supreme Court ruling, the fiscal year 2022 NTA will around 959.04 billion. So as regards, the year-on-year -year expansion of the NTA from fiscal year to 2022, uh, 2021 to 22, the LG will receive an increase of around 37.89%, corresponding to the 263.55 billion. However, uh, we must note that the NTA is based on the actual cash or collections of the national government in the third preceding year. So hence, the base for the fiscal year 2023 NTA will be the actual collections in 2020. So the NTA for 2023 amounts now is made at 820.2 billion. It's expected to be uh, significantly lower compared to the 2022 level due to the lower revenue collection in 2020. Because of course, alam -alam -alam po natin, we know for a fact, because of the mutant economic activity due to the pandemic. Okay. Now, so now pursuant to section 12 of based uh, of the Supreme Court ruling, the government also issued each, uh, executive order number 138 and based pursuant to section 12 of the EO and section 27 of the implementing rules and regulation of the EO, the DBM, the DILG Memorandum Circular number 2021-3, uh, dated September 13, 2021, or the guidelines on the implementation of personal policies and options and pursuant to executive order number 138, uh, directing the full devolution of certain functions of the executive branch to the local government was issued to ensure the fair, orderly, and transparent implementation of the EO. Uh, yan po yung ano, ang napublish po itong uh, IRR in July 29, 29, 2021 issue in the Philippine Star. Now, what are the selling features of this exam order? There's a delineation of the NG and LGU uh, roles. 
okay, preparation of the devolution transition plans, both by the national government agencies and the local government units, the creation of the committee on devolution, establishment, okay, later on, of the growth equity fund, capacity building for LGUs, roles of the LGUs, of course, strengthening and plan of planning and investment programming and budget linkage and monitoring and evaluation system, and of course, options uh, of uh, affected NGA personnel. Now, uh, in terms of uh, function services or facilities for devolution, so the executive order provides the full devolution of functions, services, and facilities uh, from the national government to local government units under based on section 17 of the local government code and other subsequent laws. So it is to be reiterated and emphasized that the EO only provides the full devolution of functions and services which have already been devolved to the LGUs pursuant to Section 17 and other subsequent relevant laws. So just to note, there will be no new or additional functions that are being devolved to the local government units. Uh, moreover, local governments uh, shall be uh, primarily or ultimately responsible and accountable for the provision of the basic services and facilities fully devolved to them in accordance with the standards uh, uh, for service delivery to the prescribed by the national government. Further, the basic uh, services uh, and facilities fully devolved shall be funded from the share of the local government units in the process of national taxes, other local revenues, local. So local chief executives shall ensure that any fund resource available for the use of their respective LGU shall be first allocated to for the provision of basic services or facilities default before applying the same for other purposes in accordance with the relevant uh, laws and budgeting and auditing rules and regulations. Also, the EO shall cover the all LGUs, all departments and agencies and instrumentalities uh, of the executive branch whose functions are in line with the devolved functions of the LGUs. So now, uh, in the interest of time, I will no longer present the details of the ongoing NG or LGU with the respective of their VPPs, including the functions of the Committee of the Devolution, and will focus on the Growth Equity Fund. Okay, so as also presented in the study, pursuant to special provision uh, number four of the local government support fund under the fiscal year 2022 GAA, RA number 11639, the appropriated amount of 1.25 or 1.25 billion shall be used as financial assistance to the identified poor, disadvantaged, and lagging LGUs for the implementation of the priority projects, which are gradually in a, uh, to gradually enable the full and efficient implementation of the functions and services of concerned LGUs as provided in Section 17 of the gov local government code. So, as mentioned also in this study, this uh, the amount it was originally uh, proposed. Yeah. Uh, 10 billion pesos, which was included in the National Expenditure Program for fiscal year 2022 for the establishment of the GEF, but it was uh, later reduced to 1.25 in the fiscal year 2022 GAA. Okay, so uh, ito po yung ano, breakdown or the allocation criteria wherein the 1.25 billion GEF shall be allocated at different levels of LGUs in the following manner. That will be 10% for provinces, cities, and barangays, and the rest are 70% for municipalities. Okay. As mentioned earlier, the, uh, the identification of the beneficiary LG shall be based on three indicators. One is the income bracket, two, poverty incidence, and per capita fiscal year 2022 NTA for its eligibility. LGU uh, under the BARM shall be excluded from the allocation of the fiscal year 2022 GF in they're already receiving a black grant. Okay. Now, the income bracket of LGU shall be utilized in the initial determination of the beneficiary LGU. Only the LGU belonging to the following income bracket shall be eligible 
beneficiaries of the fiscal year 2022 LGEF. So, yan po. So, given uh, no provincial and city LGUs fall under the fifth and sixth class income bracket, only the LGUs belonging to the fourth income bracket shall be eligible for the GEF. Okay? For municipalities po naman, only the LGUs belonging to fourth and fifth income bracket shall be eligible for the GEF. Uh, we just want to note that the uh, LGUs falling under six income brackets are all allo allocated under BARM. Now, targeting approximately at least 10% of the total municipalities at, uh, as a recipient, the identified poorest, most disadvantaged, and most lagging one, 150, yun lang, uh, only 150 municipalities belonging to the income bracket of brackets under four and fifth shall be included in the allocation of the fiscal year 2022 GEF using poverty incidence and per capita uh, FY 2022 NTA as basis in the determination. So similarly, uh, 270 uh, GIDA or uh, geographically ident uh, isolated areas, barangays located in municipalities belonging to the fourth and sixth class, a uh, fourth and fifth class shall be included in the allocation of the fiscal year 2022 GF using per capita. That is for the barangay. Okay. So from the list of beneficiary LGUs, the individual allocation of each beneficiary province, city, and municipality shall be computed based on the following factors. 50% to be allocated based on poverty incident as provided in the 2020-18 full year official poverty statistics and 2021-18 municipal and city level poverty estimates. Now, 50% to be allocated based on per capita uh, of national tax allotment shares of province, cities, and municip municipalities. So, but in the case of Gita Barangays, individual allocation shall be based solely on their per capita FY 2022 NTA shares. Okay. Now, as to the, uh, I don't know, uh, Siguro, uh, we just share with you this one uh, because uh, this will uh, probably take a lot of time. So, just to let you know, this is the uh, re uh, allocation, uh, the release of the allocation. How are we going to release? But just to note that the LGF shall be automatically and directly released to the beneficiary provinces, cities, municipalities, and barangay because they are already pre-identified. Okay, while the beneficiaries are not required to submit any documentary requirements prior to the release of the fund, the said LGUs are strongly enjoined to comply with the guidelines and policies to be prescribed with the TBM. So ito po yung ano, prescription po natin. So uh, uh, I, I will not delve on the, this much as far as how are we going to the process of releasing uh, this one. But basically, uh, we have a circular issued for the purpose that is circular number 2016-1. That was the January 4, 2016, uh, January 4. 2022, which is where in the special allotment release order shall be comprehensively released by the DBM to the Bureau of the Treasury, while the corresponding notices of cash allocation shall be released to the authorizing, I authorized government servicing bank of the beneficiaries. And upon receipt of the advice of NCA from the DBM, the BTR shall release the corresponding advice to debit account ADA. Uh, to the uh, accredited authorized government services banks of the beneficiary LGUs. So also in parallel, the BTR uh, shall inform the concerned LGU for the release of funds through the issuance of notice of advice to debit account issued or not na die, tinatawag namin dito. Okay, so ito po yon. Uh, other uh, utilization of the allocation. Uh, just the same for the information everyone it is emphasized that the local government uh, or lgsf gef shall be exclusively used by the beneficiary lgus to 
gradually enable, of course, their full and efficient implementation of the devolved functions. Shall be fund that the program shall be funded uh, uh, from the allocation of benefits shall those that are included in the respective devolution transition plan. This is very important to ito. And only the LGUs that, ha that have DTPs approved uh, by the local government Sangunian uh, shall be qualified for the beneficiaries also. It's also uh, the identification of programs and projects to be implemented. The beneficiary LGU shall conduct public consultation through the civil service, civil uh, society organizations to determine the appropriate programs and projects. Uh, more of this. So I just want to emphasize that uh, to optimize the, uh, LG, uh, the LGF and to avoid double funding, the beneficiary higher level LGU, which is uh, province, cities, and municipal prioritize in the utilization of their respective allocations so their component L to their component LGUs that did not receive any allocation from the local uh, or the GEF. Okay? So, yeah. Now, moving on, still, uh, we need to monitor this one as consistent with the special provision of the DILG uh, Office of the Secretary Budget under the fiscal year 2022 GA that the DLG shall be responsible for the monitoring and evaluation of the actual project implementation of the LGUs. And the DBM shall provide the DILG with a list of releases from fiscal year 2022 GEF for monitoring and evaluation. Okay. Uh, just to note that the beneficiary LGU shall comply with the guidelines that may be issued by the DLG for the monitoring and evaluation of the actual implementation of projects, including submission of the necessary plans, documents relative to the project design and preparation. Now, uh, in no case shall the allocation of beneficiary LGUs from the local GF be used for the following spend. In my limitation po tayo, ito po yung negative lists, okay? Payment of personal services, of course, expenditure, administrative expenses such as supplies, meals, presentation, and others, traveling expenses, whether domestic or foreign, registration fees and other expenses related to conduct and in participation in trainings and seminars, purchase, maintenance of repair and administrative office furniture and equipment and appliances, and also uh, for the uh, purchase and maintenance of motor vehicles used for the administrative purposes and other programs, projects, uh, activities, uh, and expenses that are not related to the implementation of the devolved functions and services of LGUs pursuant to Section 17 of RA 7160. Okay. Now, the fiscal year 2022 LGSF or the GF shall be recorded as a trust fund. Trust fund puyan. Uh, kaya it only be used for a specific purpose by the beneficiary LGUs and shall be made be made available for disbursement until December 31, 2023. So we're giving them up to 2023 in the implementation of the programs and projects to be implemented uh, under GEF. So after the end of the validity period, any unreleased appropriations shall lapse while undisbursed fund shall be reverted to the national treasury, particularly to the unappropriated surplus of the general fund in accordance to section 28, chapter four, book six of executive order 292 or the administrative code, administrative code of 1987. So if at any point before December 31, 2023, the beneficiary LGUs uh, determines that the funds can no longer be used or utilized. The amount received by the same LGU shall be immediately reverted to the national treasury. Okay. Now, moving on now with our uh, comments and takeaways. Okay. So, first of all, uh, as mentioned already, uh, uh, we welcome the President's budget of first value 2023 uh, by Dr. Seek and the team of the PDF, PIDS. 
Now, ito po yung uh, nakita po namin as far as uh, comments or takeaways from this presentation. On the lower NTA of LGUs for fiscal year 2023, as earlier mentioned, the NTA for fiscal year 2023 amounting to 820.3 billion is expected to be significantly lower compared to the 2022 due to lower revenue collections in 2020 because of mutual economic activity and due to the pandemic. So thus, now the LGUs are strongly encouraged to fully maximize their respective uh, local revenue generation uh, powers pursuant to RA number 7160 and other applicable laws and rules and regulations. And of course, also to exercise prudence in their respective fiscal management uh, in order to mitigate the effects of the uh, lower NTA shares of LGUs. Also, uh, just to let you know that uh, the uh, um, I mean, the, with the fo following the instruction of the president and due to the uh, demand or uh, issues raised by the uh, local government chief executives, a draft EO has, uh, is being prepared or prepared by the DBN in coordination with oversight agencies concerned to extend the full devolution transition plan period and provide additional priorities for the purpose that is uh, looking at extending the uh, implementation of the devolution up to 2027. So we're looking at a mandatory EO that we are looking for. Now, uh, Siguro, um, I will just uh, end here from the, this press, uh, as, far as, as far as our comments and uh, takeaways are concerned. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, ASEC uh, Rolly Toledo, for your valuable uh, reactions uh, to the study as well as uh, those uh, important uh, takeaways and for enlightening us on uh, the allocations uh, for the LGUs and how the uh, Growth Equity Fund will be implemented. I'm sure there are um, some questions from your presentation. We will entertain them during the open forum. Friends, our ne next discussion is a respected uh, scholar and writer. We have with us this afternoon, Mr. Telomino Santa Ana, uh, co-founder and coordinator of um, Action for Economic Reforms, uh, or AER. Uh, founded in 1996, AER has programs on macroeconomic reforms, particularly fiscal policy, governance and institutions, healthcare, and um, healthcare and pandemic resiliency and data-driven development. He is a columnist uh, for the business world and has and has uh, authored and edited uh, several books and papers on the economy and institutions. He was a recipient of the Distinguished Alumnus Award from the UP School of Economics Alumni Association on the occasion of the school's 50th year. Sir Man, the floor is now yours. Good afternoon. Uh, th thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the authors for a very enlightening, very informative uh, study. It indeed motivated me to reflect and to organize my thoughts. And I, I do share now my thoughts to the wider audience. Again, salamat. So what are my thoughts? Uh, well, even as the country, even as the country's macroeconomic fundamentals, including debt sustainability, remain sound, uh, we remain, we have to remain vigilant and assertive in furthering the reforms. VUCA, well, that is for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. A world of VUCA means that. Even seemingly small problems can suddenly become big and become a source of a crisis. Eerily, the conditions we face right now have similarities with the situation in the first half of the 1980s when the Philippines suffered a deep economic crisis. Among the factors, apart from, apart from the political crisis then, that triggered the debt crisis and recession in the 1980s were the oil crisis and rising fuel prices 
and the sudden increase in U.S. interest rates. Same conditions that we have right now. But the main difference, which the Diokno CCAT paper surfaces and highlights, is that at present, the economy is in much better shape. We have learned our lessons and we have managed our debt well. The debt ratios are not disturbing, notwithstanding the much higher level of borrowing and deficit spending during the pandemic. Uh, for this, we acknowledge the series of hard reforms done by uh, previous uh, administrations. Still, the risks we face are real, given the complexity and magnitude of the problems uh, brought about by the pandemic and other shocks. It helps economic policy making to do diagnostics and identify a narrow set of key interventions. We want to I, we want to identify what these problems are and focus on the most binding constraints or emerging binding constraints. High inflation, uh, to be sure, has become a most binding constraint. Also contributing to high inflation is the shortage of supply of agriculture commodities. The agriculture sector has been perennially weak. We cannot disregard the fact that the pandemic persists and the associated economic risks it brings. Along this line, the fiscal space we have is fragile, especially in view of a persisting pandemic, the Ukraine war, and other global shocks. So fiscal cons consolidation is still necessary even as we need to grow the economy and enhance the budget for health, social protection, and climate change. There is no escaping higher budget allocations for cer certain sectors as we grapple with high inflation, food shortages, inadequate health resources, uh, etc. Sadly, a government's response is one thing in relation to fiscal consolidation, as uh, Secretary Balisagan announced recently, there is a slowdown in government spending. Actual nominal spending even tails the rise in inflation rate. I was asked by a Business Mirror senior reporter about government spending. She asked, well, Secretary RC said he expects government spending to continue being slow until the end of the year. Third quarter government final consumption expenditure only grew 0.8%. So that's disappointing that government spending is low. In fact, based on that info, uh, real spending even went down. It's way below the inflation rate. The, the rate of government spending is below the inflation rate. The explanation here perhaps is that the government does not want to increase deficit spending and accumulate more debt as it pursues fiscal consolidation. But something is amiss about the administration's fiscal consolidation. Rationalization of government spending is necessary, but this should not mean significantly, a point raised by Justin, this should not mean significantly cutting spending at the expense of growing the economy. Spending must not only be protected, but also in, enhanced in areas like providing targeted subsidies to poor households that are reeling from the pandemic and from the global supply shocks. The population still remains, remains vulnerable to COVID-19. It's, it's not yet over. And spending requirements for pandemic resiliency and universal health care must increase. Agricultural spending also needs a boost to make the sector productive and efficient. Even the 2023 president budget, president's budget falls short of necessary spending for the critical sectors. As for example, the officials of the Department of Health and the Department of Agriculture regarding their budget. And the quick answer from them is that the budget allocation for said departments remains inadequate. For example, the DA budget has increased 
But the proposed amount of 99.81 billion pesos in 2023 is far from the request of the DA for 157 billion pesos. For the Department of Health, despite the heavy requirements for pandemic resiliency and universal health care, the proposed real expen expenditures will register a small decline in view of high inflation. Yet, even as we feel the pressure for higher spending on public goods like agriculture, universal health care, social protection, disaster risk reduction, we reiterate that we have to pursue fiscal consolidation to prevent uh, macroeconomic destabilization. Fiscal consolidation is budget rationalization. Realignment or reallocation based on development priorities is necessary. Cut the pot and the waste. Cut the budget for controversial items like unaccountable intelligence funds, excessive counterinsurgency funds, and pork barrel. Reallocate the questionable funds to health, social protection, and agriculture. Still, reallocation or re realignment is insufficient. New revenues are necessary to grow the economy and address the binding constraints that require fiscal support. The paper of Justin et al. makes an incisive point about the buoyancy of the tax system. We have the benefit of a buoyant tax system thanks to the series of tax policy reforms that previous administrations have secured. Note that these critical reforms happened in the past decade. At the same time, their paper, Justin's, Justin et al.'s paper, states the possible risks, and they do cite another study from PIDS uh, authored by Maggie, Maggie Gonzalez. Uh, such risks, for example, the external shocks, uh, compel policymakers to adopt a, this is a term from Javier Solana, a, a just in, a, in, and I quote, just in case approach. Just in case suggests additional resources. The, the case is strong for increasing taxes of certain goods in support of a fiscal consolidation. These are efficient taxes that address negative externalities and that are likewise accept acceptable to the, to the public. I refer specifically to the health taxes. And this is not controversial. Even Secretary Ben Jokno has written about the effectiveness and efficiency of health taxes, uh, where these taxes address harmful consumption and the social costs, or what we call the negative externalities. In this regard, imposing efficient taxes will not hurt overall economic growth. Uh, sin taxes serve as an example. Uh, sin products are priced inelastic, thus their taxation generates substantial revenues. But the administration is reluctant to do so, even though sin taxes, for example, and services indicate this, are acceptable to the public even to the consumers of these SIN products. Another argument for new tax revenues leading to higher tax effort is for us to meet the wish of Secretary Ben Jokne himself to achieve the A credit rating. Getting that credit upgrade becomes all the more relevant in a world of uh, high interest rates. But if you want new tax revenues in place, the process of reform must start immediately. I have been reading Ben Jokna, by the way, and I again cite him. And in one of his papers, he said, any tax reform has to be done in the first half of the political administration. It has to be done now. Something that the paper of Justin et al. says, pertains to the risks. We, we have to guard against fiscal erosion. Uh, President Marcos, for example, is partial to removing the value-added tax for certain goods or services like utilities. Recently, 
the chair of the Ways and Means Committee of the House of Representatives, uh, Joey Salceda, said that, and I quote him, Marcos wants House to study removing VAT on utilities. This proposal will only aggravate the fiscal problem. Perhaps as a last point, we have to give attention to the coherence of monetary policy and other economic policies, including fiscal policy. The spike in inflation rate and the threat of persistent inflation cannot solely be addressed through monetary policy. Many of the problems are supply side problems. Fiscal policy and other economic tools have to be deployed to address the inflation problem. Evidently, a most binding constraint. To conclude, the bold yet correct approach is for the administration to take the bull by the horns. We have to generate new revenues. We have to cut budget support that favors narrow special interests. We have to remove the supply bottlenecks by removing protection to vested interests. The tasks are most challenging. But the paper from PIDS, from Ajokno uh, Sikat et al., is a most, important, a most important contribution towards policymaking. My suggestion is uh, for this paper to reach a wider audience, it might be nice to have shorter pieces that can be published in newspapers and on, social, on online media. In, Able, so as that so that policymakers, journalists, and other stakeholders will be able to appreciate the issues that you have raised. Uh, maraming salamat. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Men Santa Ana of uh, the Action for Economic Reforms. Thank you, sir, for your thought-provoking views. Um, friends, um, at this point, uh, we will now entertain questions uh, from the audience. I saw in our Q&A box that we have uh, several uh, um, very good questions. So may I invite my, our uh, speakers to turn on uh, your videos for the um, open forum. So let's start with a question from uh, Mr. Merwin um, Salazar. Um, Executive Director Merwin Salazar of the um, uh, CEPO, Senate Economic Planning Office. It can be seen in the uh, medium term uh, fiscal framework that government spending is projected to grow by an average, by an annual average of 7.2%, which is slower compared to the six year average expenditure growth prior to the pandemic of 12.5 percent the mt uh ff puts emphasis on boosting the recovery from the pandemic sustaining a high growth a high economic growth and reducing poverty how do you think these objectives will be met given uh that projected growth in government spending in the medium term is lower compared to the period before the pandemic um, Dr. Sika Chastine, uh, would you like to take a crack at this question? Then we can uh, um, go to our uh, discussions for their insights, please. Yeah, thank, yeah, thank you, Shudla. And thank you very much, E.D. Mervin. He's always, he always attends our workshops here. That's a very difficult question, and I'm not sure I want to venture an, an answer because I'm not, you know, with the executive branch. I don't know if... Uh, Secretary Toledo would like to try and answer this question um, with regard to how will that lead to the growth that is anticipated given that government spending is lower than anticipated. If I think of it, well, no, I don't even want to go there theoretically. So <laughs> perhaps Secretary, yeah, Secretary Toledo, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, Asik Toledo, uh, maybe hear from you, sir. Yeah, thank you. As mentioned by Dr. Sika, Justin, this is a def difficult question. So mm -hmm. what, we're, what we have presented or what is consistent with the medium-term fiscal framework is a projection that we want to uh, uh, 
track in terms of o o over the medium term or within this administration. That is, uh, of course, uh, both uh, uh, having the fiscal consolidation strategy, but also noting the risk, okay? The risk of as far as our uh, uh, debt levels of growth and sustainability. Of course, this is really will be underpinned, of course, by uh, increasing our revenue, of course, uh, for through tax policy and tax administration, uh, refer, as well as the declining deficit target sector. So I understand that we emphasize that the uh, disbursement is going down, but yes, that is anchored on what this uh, administration's plan to achieve in terms of uh, lowering our debt to GDP ratio and even bringing back our fiscal deficit up to uh, due, uh, even back to a pre-pandemic period. So yes, uh, hopefully with the opening up of the economy, we can increase the possible, uh, of course, uh, increase in revenue and hopefully we can still increase that uh, debt disbursement target for the uh, over the medium term. Okay. Thank you very much, Asa Toledo. And Sir Men, uh, would you have anything to say? Fiscal consolidation is necessary. We all recognize that. But as we also recognize, we still have to grow the economy. And there, there's the tension. On, on the one hand, if you want to grow the economy, we have to preserve the essential spending for public goods. But fiscal consolidation will also entail some <laughs> rationalizing and even cutting of uh, spending. Mm -hmm. That's why I, I think the approach there is to look at the budget, see the items where we can cut and reallocate them to the, the essential uh, goods. But at the same time, there is room for new revenues, mm -hmm. which will not affect growth. And Sir Man, in your reactions a while ago, you mentioned of, um, you know, there is a need to increase taxes of, of certain uh, goods to support this con fiscal consolidation. I think you mentioned about, um, specifically about health taxes, sir. Um, are there other forms, um, types of taxes that you think should be introduced? Well, the Department of Finance, and I know I note uh, a question here, the Department of Finance has other uh, proposals. I gave the example of health taxes because they are the most efficient and the most politically acceptable to the public. It's politically feasible. Of course, there are certain interests that will oppose uh, such taxes. But we have shown in the past that we can increase these taxes with the support of the public. And it can generate substantial revenues. Thank you very much, uh, uh, E.D. Um, Sir Men. Okay, speaking of that question, which uh, you 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 mentioned, we have one here from Mr. Chong Bilaiban of ADB, and this is addressed to to Justine. This is a uh, there are two questions from the same um, uh, participant. Um, the first one is for uh, Dr. Sika. What is your take on the new? tax policy and administration reform measures under the medium-term fiscal framework. Um, that is, uh, which include the ease of paying tax bill, tax bill, the VAT on digital service providers and single-use plastic bag taxes. Any update uh, will be useful, uh, Justine. Okay, thank you, Sheila. And thank you, Ekobol, for attending. Um, and the very important question as well. Uh, I can't speak, I don't really know the, the current status. What I learned from, I was with Congresswoman Stella, is that the single-use plastic uh, had already passed uh, the House of Representatives. I know that there's another bill there uh, with respect to mining as well that has, you know, been, been approved as well. And the, there are remaining uh uh, proposals from the, the, the Duterte administration, such as the Real Property Valuation, which is the Chain 3 Act, which I'm a very strong advocate for, as well as the uh, PEFITA, which is also very important. So I think that these are the remaining reforms that um, some of which are already identified as priority legislative agenda of this current administration. But if I could just, you know, bring this back to the debt sustainability uh, analysis results that uh, the Buki Gonzalez and I had, 
we we categorically said there that that is sustainable and manageable as long as there are no policy reversals, which means that there are no changes in the reforms that the tax reforms that were passed by earlier administration. So that's very crucial because we were already able to show through our tax buoyancy analysis that you know the tax system is relatively, at least in the short run, reactive to changes in GDP. So this is very important and good in terms of sustainability. But if there would be any major policy reversals, this might jeopardize um, the, the sustainability of, of debt, at least from an academic perspective, research perspective, that's how we see it, which is why these reforms that are currently in place agree with the ED Santana that there, sh there could still be room for more reforms. But apart of that, from that, I think that the ease of doing business bill and again, I'm not a spokesperson for the administration. Perhaps someone from the DBCC Secretary Toledo could say about something about it. It's really also to improve tax administration. We heard that at the at the start of the the this current administration that this was the priority of the economic team. Uh, apart from the remaining reform packages in in Congress, would also be improved tax administration, and this ease of doing business would uh, reform would perhaps address this. Now. Um, with regard to Sharper's, uh, I want to echo what um, E.D. Santana said earlier with regard to, and also Sectoledo, with regard to there is need for fiscal consolidation, but it, it will be strategic. Okay, there is continued strategic uh, targeting uh, when it comes to social protection programs and social welfare programs. So that that is one way rather than to give this is my opinion, okay, my own opinion. The rather than to give across the board, uh, you know, subsidies to all, I think the best way really would be to have targeted subsidies to those who really need it. Of course, there would be challenges in identifying, but I think that we have improved, especially since the start of COVID-19 pandemic, when we saw the difficulty in giving the ayudas. Um, we have improved in terms of the um, identifying those who really need the assistance the most. And I think this is the way to go strategically, um, you know, uh, subsidizing those uh, in the, you know, who need it the most. So thank you for that. Thank you very much, uh, Justine. Okay, um, the second question of Mr. Uh, Aikapol of ADB is for uh, Asak Toledo, but Asak Toledo, you may also want to comment on the first question, okay. So here is the question for Asak Toledo. What is your assessment on the uh, growth equity fund budget execution capacity for the, the set fund? Under the NTA, the budget execution rate for LGUs are on average around 70% only. Since the GEF targets are at relatively, since GEF targets relatively small, LGUs, the budget execution capacity may be much lower than the national average. Since SARO is valid only for 12 months until December 2023, how does DBM help those LGUs carry out projects and support timely disbursement? What a, uh, this is a very good question. Asik Toledo, please. Yeah. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, on the first questions, I will just, uh, of course, uh, leave that as is, uh, as already been, uh, answered by Dr. Uh, Justin, and probably it would be good that we'll be asked to our uh, uh, counterpart at the Department of Finance. Thank you. But now on the question, the second question which was raised, yes, uh, please note that the implementation of the GF is the first year this year, 2022. So as to the uh, execution rate, probably we will know that probably after the end of the period next year, we can uh, consolidate what has been what has transpired in the implementation of this program under the GF. Okay. While it is true that uh, the GF targets the uh, LGUs, I'm not just a uh, small. Uh, LGUs, but of course, uh, we are looking at this one is uh, programs or the programs and projects that should be implemented should already be identified in their uh, annual investment program. Meaning to say that has already been uh, prepared and even before the execution of the budget, uh, it's already there that they have to pick from that annual investment program for ready implementation because that has been uh, gone through the evaluation and even uh, discussion in the Sangguni uh, 
So I guess uh, the compliance or rather the execution rate most likely will have an average uh, higher than what is in the implementation of the national tax allotment or the NDA from the regular one. Because this, these are also specific programs and projects that is supposed to be implemented by NJ. Also that uh, the SARO, if you take a note, we are implementing 2022 and yet we are giving them extension up to 2023 December. So there is a, a room really as to uh, the completion of the implementation or the completion of the programs and projects that is to be implemented under the GEF. So we started releasing this uh, after we have issued the guidelines uh, uh, for uh, as far as the GEF is concerned. So uh, we just, uh, so that's why already we released this. Uh, to 100% uh, already uh, because this is automatically released. So uh, given that, and plus as mentioned to you, uh, we've done release in 22 and we've given them up to 2023 for the implementation. So most likely this uh, GF will be uh, obligated and dispersed uh, even the, in the implementation of the programs, uh, most likely higher than what is uh, uh, being done or rather what has been accomplished under the uh, NTA. Thank you very much, um, Asif Toledo. So we have been talking about uh, fiscal consolidation, an important aspect of which is fiscal discipline, and the DBM has introduced the cash uh, budgeting system um, as a way to um, enhance or strengthen uh, fiscal discipline among the different uh, national government agencies. May we just know, uh, as Asik Toledo, how effective uh, the system is in terms of, you know, enforcing that fiscal discipline, which is uh, the objective of, of, of this measure. Um, have you, right. uh, has there been any assessment uh, done yes. so far by the DB answer? Yeah, thank you, Sheila. Yes, uh, in the implementation of the cash budgeting systems, uh, we've done some assessment, not just only in the implementation of cash budgeting system, wherein we implemented the one-year validity of operations, wherein we found out that given this policy of the government, it has improved the utilization of this uh, budget from the different departments and agencies, given the fact that uh, probably there is a pressure that for the implementing agencies to implement programs and projects prescribed under this uh, policy, which is the uh, cash-based budgeting. And before we call it the one-year uh, uh, one validity of appropriations, but this time we have this adopted the cash budgeting system, wherein uh, appropriations has been obligated, delivered, accepted, and implemented, and validated should only be uh, should be paid within the period is prescribed. And also noting that uh, also under the cash budget systems, we are allowing agencies to have that what we call the early procurement activities. So mean to say even before the approval of the GA, agencies are allowed to have this early procurement of activities short of award, just to make sure that programs and projects should be implemented without delay. So once that has been done and the J has been approved, they can now award that immediately. Okay, thank you for that, Asset Toledo. Let's um, do um, other uh, questions from our uh, participants. We have one here, okay, we have one here from uh, Dr. Uh, Maki uh, Gonzalez. Uh, okay, this remains an answer in our Q&A uh, box. Okay, so let, let me read it. What is and will be the impact of the Bandanas ruling on the, on the budget? Um, uh, I think you covered this in your presentation, Asset Toledo. You mentioned about the increase year on year of uh, some 250 uh, yeah. billion pesos, but this depends also on the actual uh, uh, revenue allocation, sir. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Thank you, Sheila. Again. Yeah. Uh, basically, uh, the impact of sorry, the impact uh, of the budget, uh, in particular. Uh, given the lowering projection, the lower projection, or rather, because a uh, collection projected revenue, or rather, the actual collection in 2020. So there is a lower 
uh, share of the LGUs as far as their national tax allotment. Okay, so basically, uh, as you will all know, even in uh, 2022, at uh, the big impact in the total in the budget, specifically for the national government, we have less around 185.17 billion, because based on the supreme without the supreme court ruling only the amount supposed to be allocated for the local government units is 773.87 so following that without the supreme court ruling supposed to be a lower share of the nta for the lgus but given the supreme court ruling for 2022 uh, the amount is, is have increased to 100, uh, rather 185.17. So that's the impact uh, as far as the budget is concerned. But of course, we know for a fact that uh, it's still a government, okay? Uh, it's still within the government. It's just a matter of uh, the programs and projects is uh, kumbaga, uh, allocated to the local government units. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, yeah. Asik uh, Toledo. Okay, uh, please go ahead, uh, Justine. Yeah, I just like to add something to that. Um, I think moving forward now, what's important is how the LGUs will be using the additional allocations that would be given to them. Um, I think it's very important so that it can impact immediately the 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 local economy and contribute to national economic growth and development. I think that's what's important because we can't do anything about the Supreme Court ruling. It will really, you know, we really have to give that the, the that amount, the broadened base for the computation of the intergovernmental fiscal transfers. And I think that most of the efforts of the policymakers, well, based on our research also on local governments, has really been into how to improve the utilization and you know the strategic implementation of local development plans and programs. That's why uh, I think Asek Toledo earlier highlighted the importance of the annual investment programs and the uh, comprehensive development plans of local government units. So I think that's where a lot of focus should be, especially with respect to the infrastructure projects, which uh, some local, local government units still struggle with. Even this has already been um, devolved back in 1991 and they've received con continued assistance from national government for this so but again these are my own personal views for this thank you mm -hmm. thank you uh justine um earlier uh one of the takeaways i remember one of the takeaways of asset toledo was uh well he um emphasized the lower nta for uh um for fiscal year 2023 versus uh, fiscal year 2022 thus LGUs are encouraged to tap other sources or employ at other strategies to better deliver um, this uh, to, to better deliver uh, public services to, to their uh, constituents. Uh, Justine, uh, would you have any ideas in mind in terms of you know other sources of funds, other for for LGUs um, or or how they can uh, better generate uh, revenues? Any based on your uh, studies on um, local governments you have done uh, ample studies on local governments and perhaps we can also ask uh, sir sir men for his uh, insights on this yeah thank you sheila for that question and yeah actually this would involve you know even tapping the private sector um mm -hmm. or for local governments actually borrowing as well there's still room for that uh, although some are very um cautious about borrowing um, as a local government unit. But what I do know is, let's say for the case of local water systems, uh, we released a Philippine Journal of Development uh, article that looked at the regulatory and institutional framework for local government, uh, local water systems and the local water service sector. So this is a devolved function. LGUs do have the mandate to provide local water services. Um, but uh, there has been challenges because of the overlapping and ambiguous um, regulatory framework. Um, they have different options. They can put up their own water district. The local government can do this themselves, or they can tap the private sector as well. So here, I think there's in 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 terms of that particular devolved service, there could be increased role for private sector participation. But in order to mm -hmm. to do that, there should be improvements as well in the institutional and regulatory framework uh, for this. And our paper, I think it was published last year. Um, would actually identify certain areas there. I was a co-author with a, a water expert. So, so that's one way that could, you know, help free up or 
you know, get more, be able to deliver more services even with the smaller transfers that will be received next year. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sikat. Okay, Sir Men, would you have any thoughts on this? Well, I would like to reiterate a point raised by Justin during her presentation, the reform on real property evaluation. Mm -hmm. That's a very important reform. Mm -hmm. It may not immediately result in revenues for, for local government because this is the tax. The, the, that tax really will benefit the, the local governments. But we all do know that uh, real property, that many local governments uh, really do not co collect the, the <laughs> taxes from real property. However, that reform introduced by, well, initiated by the Department of Finance will create some motivation and some space for local governments to, to increase uh, real property taxes based on the real property valuation. Uh, another area I think it, it will be in light of the devolution of services will is, is for local governments again pursuing the point of Justin for for local government to look at the opportunities from the the, the from the devolution of uh, services uh, health is a good example universal health care is anchored on service delivery networks mm -hmm. and yeah. some well we have to stress that the service delivery network is not just a public sector initiative it's a mm -hmm. public a private public sector private sector initiative the the private clinics the private health professionals mm -hmm. will be part of that a service delivery network and th that will strengthen universal health care at the local government level. Okay. Thank you for that, uh, Sir Men. I think I, I saw Justin uh, raised her hand. Oh, go ahead, Justin, if you have any additional yes. points. Thank you, Sheila, and thank you, Edi Santana. Well, it's a good thing you, I, for, I forgot that. Yeah, but the real property valuation, really, because I've said so much, that's really very important. When we look at the, okay, so, before the main source of revenues of local governments was real property tax collections. But this was overtaken in the past decade with business taxes, local business taxes. So this was very surprising. So I think that's why they looked at the, the age of the schedule of the market value, which is the basis of the computation of real property taxes. And what was found back in 20, um, let me get my figures, 2019 was that the age of the city uh, schedule of market values was about 10 years old and the age of the uh, provincial market value schedule of market values was eight years old. What this means is, I, I'm sure this has improved since then because the BLGF has all, always been flagging this. But what this means is that taxes are being imposed on older market prices of real properties. It's not capturing the adjustments in the, the property values. Uh, moving forward. So that's why the, the that train three package, the property valuation package, is really very important. Now, another thing with regard to how could LGUs possibly um, provide the devolved services, the services that have also been devolved to them, given that they will be given less resources in 2023 because of the formula. Well, part of our recommendations in that local water paper also was to, you know, look at this efforts across different LGUs, let's say, in providing certain services, inter-LGU cooperation. I know that in some provinces, they do do this, but this requires the political will and a lot of cooperation. Let's say in the case of water systems, you know, sometimes if you're talking about a level three, so that's the pipe in, not just the possible, not just the pump water, it, it would be more efficient. You could take advantage of economies of scale if several LGUs contiguous to each other would provide that service together. I don't know yet how that would look like, but that's a possible thing. And mm -hmm. while we are, you know, well, as Toledo already mentioned it earlier, that there might be an mandatory executive order that might um, extend the implement the transition, the evolution transition. Well, during this time, maybe the, the functions that are devolved could really be defined across the different levels of government units. This could be revisited. And also options for inter-LGU cooperation, although I know that's really a political question. But in some places, this is being done. Um, okay. You know, contiguous municipalities are cooperating to provide up to waters, uh, 
water supply and sewerage because these have externalities. It doesn't mm -hmm. end at the border of your municipality. It crosses borders. So thank mm -hmm. you for that. Thank you, Justin. Okay, we have a question here for the DBM. Uh, this is from Brian Benson B. In determining the level of underspending of any government agency, which is more accurate, total disbursements vis-a-vis uh, -vis total appropriations or the total obligations vis-a-vis uh, -vis total appropriations? Asek Toledo, please. Yeah, thank you, Sheila. Thank you for that question. Yes, uh, what, yeah, part of the assessment in terms of the budget uh, preparation in determining the allocation of funds for the different departments and agency is what we call the BUR or the budget utilization ratio. So the formula that we use basically of uh, part budget utilization is disbursement versus your program disbursement. Because we know for a fact we cannot just uh, compare that to our appropriations because uh, our disbursement is composed of what? The prior years at the same time, the current years. So basically, what has been submitted to us based on their budget execution documents uh, as far as disbursement. So we use what has been programmed, not just the appropriation. So that's how we compute for the BUR. But it would be good also to uh, note that uh, the appropriation is also can be used actually both the obligation and the uh, the appropriation. But the what we have uh, used in terms of the allocating use in the allocation is the uh, program or rather disbursement over the program disbursement submitted by the agencies. Okay, thank you very much, Asak Toledo. So we are down to um. Our last two, uh, our last two questions uh, for this open forum. Okay, we have a question here from Emelgar um, Paasa. Uh, with regards to PhilHealth contributions, uh, PhilHealth members are paying at an increasing amount. What are the plans for PhilHealth's budget? Can the government further provide budget so that the paying members will not be overburdened with the increasing fees? Okay, I'm not sure if... Uh, you want to answer this uh, question, Asek to Asek to Ledo? <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I have to read it. <laughs> oh, for transparency. Anyway, okay. So just to let you know, uh, part of the priority of the administration, or even the past administration, as mentioned also in this study, is the social sector in particular, education, health, and social services. Under the social or the health sector. We have been providing support as far as for our indigents uh, in terms of the uh, implementation of the National Health Insurance Program. So for this year, uh, for the 2022-3 budget, we have provided 100.2 billion pesos to provide Filipinos with accessible and affordable health care services as mandated under our Republic uh, RA number 11-22-3 or the Universal Health Care Law. So basically, uh, we have targeted beneficiaries. Baka kasama siya dito. So 12.75 million indigents under the National Household Targeting System. So we have identified that. 8 million senior officials, uh, senior, official, senior citizens pursuant to uh, Republic Act Number 10645 or the Expanded Senior Citizens Act Law. And also, we have also identified 143,000 424 unemployed persons with disability and 99,800 financially incapable point of service patients and 25,512 payapa at masaganam pamayanan beneficiaries. So uh, basically, this, this is how the program or the National Health Insurance Program uh, provided in the budget, the targeted beneficiaries for this uh, program. So I hope I have answered your questions. Thank okay. you. Thank, thank you very much, Asek uh, Toledo. Okay, uh, now for our uh, last. Okay, Can sir, please ask, go uh, ahead, Paul. Go ahead, Paul. A couple of points from, I, I will, I'll take up from what Yusek Rolly said. Okay. To better appreciate universal healthcare, we return to what are its essential, its essential, teachers the first the whole population has to be covered yeah and you yeah. did mention that in fact the majority of the population are directly subsidized because mm -hmm. many 
just cannot afford the majority can still cannot afford paying the the premium mm -hmm. but of course there's a segment of the population that can pay that can pay the premium or can give uh, contributions and this is based on our, on our ability to pay mm -hmm. the, the, the second feature essential feature is it's not only should we ensure the universal coverage of the population we also have to expand the essential services mm. ill health mm. yeah right now the, the services are still narrow because we, do, we just don't have enough resources but the this the desirable goal is to expand the essential services and that will require uh, additional resources the, the third feature is we also want to reduce the out of pocket expenses that's right Mm -hmm. that, that's the idea behind universal health care that people families won't be disturbed that if one, someone gets sick there's going to be a catastrophe because of the, the, the lack of funds all this then would require tremendous uh, resources mm -hmm. and taxes alone or the, that will then be funneled to the general budget will be not enough. It's again a question of there's no free lunch. If we will be getting more from the government budget, that will that will mean increasing taxes. And uh, a while ago, we have been having problems on what taxes should we increase no, in light in light of mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so many difficulties we face. So that's how I will look at the problem. There's no choice but have that combination of subsidies from the general budget but mm -hmm. even those who have the ability to pay must assume that uh, responsibility thank you those, thank you sir man those are very good points okay and it's a good segue to our final uh question uh also from brian uh Bensonlin, and this is for you uh justin uh you already covered this um um, in your response um, in the in the previous questions, but let me still read it. Um, the president uh, asked the uh, HOR Ways and Means Committee to study the possibility of removing the VAT on public utilities, with which has estimated revenue losses at 187 billion pesos per year. Uh, what do you think are the tax measures that? Um, the the congress um may or should consider in order to make up for the revenue loss justine okay. yeah thank you sheila and thank you mr c for the very important question and you're right sheila i did mention there are other tax efforts uh currently in congress some have been sitting there for some time the train three the train two plus plus the mining one uh there's um there's also the pifita and then the other single use that that could also possibly contribute to additional revenues for the national government. Um, so, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. There are other options. Uh, I, I don't know what to say of the regarding the, the removal of the VAT of utilities, but also the Satana also mentioned this earlier. That this was, in fact, in the news. But um, what I do know is that there are tax reform packages that have been left by the previous administration, which are still priority on the list of this current uh, administration. It's on the legislative agenda. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. C. Well, we just had a very engaging, very enlightening uh, um, conversation. Uh, but to cap our discussion, may I ask all our speakers from some brief parting words, if uh, you have any. May we hear first from our study authors. Uh, Okay, Dr. Sikat and Mr. Ruiz, I think Dr. Sikat, uh, uh, Dr. Sikat may want to uh, speak on behalf of our team. Justine, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done, but I guess the message in particular of this study is that priorities still are clearly on social welfare, uh, development of human capital and um, infrastructure. Um, Local governments still were trying to, to manage that adjustment with the Mandanus Garcia Supreme Court ruling that is still manageable and the tax system is apparently, it seems to be based on our results as of now, buoyant, but there are still, there's still room for improvement. And um, 
we need everybody, you know, all hands on deck. You know, every single person has a role to play. I always say this uh, in whatever talk I, I have. Everyone has a role to play uh, there. So <laughs> thank you. I, have, I said so much on it. <laughs> Thanks, Sheila. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Justine. Okay, I saw uh, Mark on the screen. Also, let me call, also call him. Mark, would you have anything to say? Brief parting um, words, if you have any, please. Just to add on uh, Dr. Sikat's uh, parting message and uh, also uh, in line with uh, Director Santa Ana's uh, comments earlier, uh, there are a lot of, uh, a number of tax reforms that are we are anticipating. And uh, what we just need to monitor is that they should not only be flexible to the economic activity, they should also contain equity and efficiency objectives. Rather than just trying to keep the regime afloat. All right, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Okay, now let's have uh, Asik Rolito, to lead up the DPM. Sir, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Ashila. And first of all, again, thank you very much for being part of this uh, uh, webinar that we have uh, conducted by the PDS, PIDS, in particular, the study of Dr. Jock uh, Sikat uh, together with uh, his team, her team. Okay, I just want to emphasize that the President Marcos and the Cabinet are determined to, of course, the achieve the economic uh, transformation towards, of course, inclusive and sustainable. And uh, hence, uh, we see that the, uh, to steer this nation to prosperity uh, is truly deserved to resound through the pages of the National Expenditure Program, which was discussed by uh, just uh, Dr. Just, Justine. So, uh, we are on track, as I meant to say, uh, on track for 2023, in spite, of course, we know for a fact that there are external headwinds. We will sustain our growth momentum uh, in, uh, as far as momentum. So, as you can see, the government uh, disbursement uh, will increase to 20% of, uh, will rather remain at 20% of GDP on the average over the entire plan. So, on the path, we will pursue this one. Uh, uh, of course, in the continuation of the expansion of the uh, economy so that we can achieve what we have promised or rather what's indicated in our medium-term fiscal uh, framework, which I don't want to uh, state already because it's already mentioned in the study. So thank you very much again and uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Asik uh, Toledo. And finally, let's hear from uh, E.D. Men Santana, the AER, sir. It's worth reiterating the main point from the paper of Justin, Mark, and Robert, that our fiscal situation is sound despite the headwinds. But because of those headwinds, we face a lot of challenges. And they make that very important caveat. We are sound so long as we address the risks. And there are real risks, and it surfaced in this discussion. For example, the proposal to remove the VAT on utilities is a big risk. So th that will also be my response to the to the last question. Instead of looking for new revenues, mm -hmm. then let's let's request the executive not to be tempted to lift that the VAT for utilities. Maraming salamat. At maraming salamat din po, um, Sir uh, Men Santa Ana of the AER. Well, friends, uh, we hope that this webinar has given everyone greater clarity of the National Expenditure Program for 2023 or the President's Budget. Well, it remains um, to be seen how the final uh, version of the National Budget will look like, but hopefully it is uh, really something that is uh, truly responsive to the country's pressing needs as we... Uh, uh, endeavor to recover from this pandemic and support our LGUs as they assume uh, bigger responsibilities. And along with this, it is important to promote responsible, accountable, and efficient utilization of public funds, um, ensure uh, fiscal sustainability, increase uh, the revenue effort, and of course, uh, promote inclusive uh, economic growth. So, um, at this point, please join me in thanking all our speakers for the nuggets of wisdom that they have shared with us uh, this afternoon. 
And thank you to, to those who join in, a, in the discussion by sending uh, your comments and questions. Let's show our appreciation through a big virtual clap. Okay, and here are the winners of our webinar raffle. Um, from Zoom, we have Chef, Jeffy John Tumarong and Pia Alora. And from Facebook, Mary Jane Rocamora Comena. So Jeffy, Pia, and Mary Jane, uh, our webinar team will contact you for the delivery of your prize. And finally, we have some reminders. Okay, so you can access all the presentations from today's uh, webinar on the PIDS website. Um, okay, and flash on the screen is uh, also the link to the full study of uh, Dr. Uh, Justine Sikat and his and her co-authors. Please answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. Your comments are important uh, to us to improve our virtual events. In addition, please regularly visit our website and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We also have a YouTube channel where you can access the recordings of our uh, past events. And finally, we would like to um, acknowledge the various organizations from the government, academe, civil society, business, and international uh, development community that joined us today. So friends, this concludes our virtual virtual policy forum. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you Sir Toledo and Sir Santana. Sir, man, nice to see you again. Mar salamat sa inyong lahat. Good to see you, even online. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yeah, just, salamat. all right. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Sheila. Bye, bye bye. Thank you very much Thank po you. sa inyong lahat. Thank see you. you in our future events. Yeah. Thank you, RSDRID and management. <laughs>